Good evening, and welcome to the History and Genealogy Virtual Classroom. Today is April 26th, 2021, and the time is 635. Thank you for joining us. My name is Robin McDonough, and I will be moderating this Zoom session. Today's class, The Google Earth of the Last Century, Fire Insurance Maps, will be taught by Dan Lillienkamp. This class will be recorded and made available on the St. Louis County Library's website and on the library's YouTube channel. Please ask questions by clicking on the Q&A icon and typing your question or comment. The instructor will answer questions at the end of this session. You will find a link to the handout in the chat. Closed captioning is available by clicking on the closed captioning icon on your Zoom screen. I will now turn this over to Dan and we will begin the class. Good evening and welcome. Um, as Robin said, my name is Dan William Camp. I'm a reference specialist at history and genealogy at St. Louis County Library. Uh, I've worked in the department for 14 years and I have been researching my own family's genealogy for more than 20 years. So tonight uh, we're going to look at fire insurance maps. Now, before I get started into them oh, too much, I call it the Google Earth of the last century. If you've not used Google Earth, or for that matter, just Google uh, Maps and use the drive feature where you can go down and look at the environment, you can look at the houses where your ancestors used to live, see what they looked like today. Um, it's kind of a cool feature to have. But the built environment changes over time. Uh, there are people who grew up in St. Louis uh, in recent years that never saw the arena from Highway 40. Um, you know, over time, buildings get demolished, urban renewal happens, um, new buildings are built, uh, there's tornadoes, there's floods, there's fires. And so we get at best an inexact picture of what the environment of our ancestors were. And what fire insurance maps do is give us a glimpse into what their environment was like. So tonight we're gonna cover three principal things. Um, the first is a brief history of the fire insurance maps. Next, we're gonna go into some case studies and they're gonna be using the database that we have at St. Louis County Library. And then finally, we're going to go into some other sources where you can find fire insurance maps uh, if you don't have a St. Louis County Library card and don't live in the metropolitan area, you can still find some of these same maps online. And I wanna look at some of those and give examples of how to use those. So let's begin with the brief history so the first fire insurance maps ever created uh, were created in the 1700s in London. Um, insurance was becoming a thing and they had the idea that they would offer fire insurance to uh, people who were willing to pay for it. And in order to underwrite the policies, the insurance agents needed to know what exactly the property was like. I mean, it would be great. I come in and say, oh yeah, I own a 20 room mansion. Uh, it's totally made out of brick. Give me a policy and they say, okay. And I actually have a three room house uh, made of sticks and uh, it burns down and I go to collect on my mansion that I never had in the first place. They aren't gonna go for that. They needed to know whatever piece of property looked like. And so they came up with the design for fire insurance maps to map out. They literally sent people around to map out the city and to describe what the different structures in it looked like. The idea came to the United States in the 1850s. 1853 was the first one in the United States and it was for here, New York City. Uh, the first one came to St. Louis uh, it was 1856, and it covered that area of the riverfront that I've uh, 
blocked off, basically from Carr Street in the north to either Sear or Plum Street in the south, the Mississippi River on the east, and Broadway on the west. So a pretty small area, but in 1856, the city, that was pretty much the whole city. We tend to forget about that. We think, well, the city uh, is what it is today. This was pretty much it. And this is what that map looked like. And I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on this because I'm gonna spend time on others, but I'm gonna point out some things that were there and are still there, or except for one of them. Um, this is 1857 fire insurance map for St. Louis. Um, that's the old courthouse where the arrow is pointing on the map. And the old cathedral, uh, both of those look quite different today as I'm sure you know. And then finally down here on the, on the wharf was the old rock house, uh, which had originally intended to be preserved uh, as part of the arch grounds, uh, but they had to tear it down to move it. And when they did that, some of the building materials disappeared. So only a little bit of it survives and it's on display in the old courthouse. But let's look at some case studies because this is all nice and interesting, but who cares if we can't use it for anything? So I've got five case studies that I want to look at. Uh, Margaret Hell's will, she was my great, great grandmother. She had some property. Uh, a house I used to live in when I lived in the city a long time ago. Uh, an old stone house in Carondelet. Uh, if you're familiar with the Carondelet area, you know there's all these old stone houses that were built in the 1840s and 50s. Uh, they're pretty interesting architectural feature that's there and nowhere else. Wanted to go outside of the city and look at Hermannhof Winery. And finally, I want to look at the St. Louis World's Fair because yes, there were fire insurance maps for the fair. So let's start with the will. So this is Margaret Metzger of Hell. Uh, she was born in uh, Boxville, France, and she died here in St. Louis on the 20th of April, 1922. And she left a will. Her husband predeceased her, and uh, she disposed of quite a lot of property. And I'm not going to read the whole will to you, but I'm going to read some of it. Uh, to kind of work through this example. So this is the will. She left something to all of her children. Um, the ones that got more valuable property had to contribute cash back to the will to make up for the ones that got less and then they got cash out of it. It's pretty complex. But according to terms of her will, she had property at 7719 Ivory Street. Ivory Avenue, rather. And she gave that to her daughter-in-law, Minnie Hell, who was the wife of her son, Max. And his whereabouts were unknown. He just disappeared. So we've got one address. This next paragraph gives to the property at 7721 Ivory to daughter Linda Pickering, nay Hell. She gives the property at 7723 Ivory to her son, Julius. And a property at 7725 to her daughter, Estella Beck. And then the property at 7729 Ivory to her son, Alphonse. And her property at 7731 Ivory Avenue to her daughter, uh, Julia William Camp, my great grandmother. And the property at 7723 Ivory Avenue to her daughter, Ada Fleer, nay hell. And there's other properties involved, but these are where we're pretty much going to stop um, because it looks like these all line up in a row. 77, 19, 21, 23, 25, 29, 31, and 33. 
So if I go on to uh, Google Maps and uh, go down, I can sure enough find these properties, 7719, 7721, 7723, and 7725, all in a row. They're all brick row houses. So that kind of makes sense. I can see exactly what those people were left. But if I move on down the street, this one's 7725. But there is no 7729 or 7731 or 7733. They're gone. They're replaced by this parking lot for this uh, muffler shop. Well, I'm pretty sure she didn't, you know, leave one of her kids part of a parking lot and another one, another part of a parking lot and part of a muffler shop. I'm pretty sure there were probably houses there. She said there were in the will. <coughs> so what do these look like? Well, we have no way of knowing unless we've got a time machine. Or do we? Well, we've got this fire insurance map database available through the library with your St. Louis County Library card. You can access it at home. And you look at it and you can do a, a search by a place. But instead, I would strongly encourage everyone that's gonna use this to look at the interactive map because it's a lot easier. So the interactive map, this, this software, this, this database is just gonna cover Missouri and Illinois. You could buy it for the entire United States. The library just bought Missouri and Illinois because it's quite expensive. If there were a demand, uh, we would possibly consider ordering uh, additional states, but you know, we're not gonna just whimsically buy them. So it gives us an opportunity to enter an address. And when I enter in the address for these properties, it pins it right there on the Google map that I can see where it is. And then if I scroll down, I can see the list of the years that the fire insurance maps exist for this area of St. Louis. So if I click on the show, it overlays the fire insurance map, in this case, the index of the fire insurance map, um, over the top. And I can look and figure out which of the individual maps then I need to look at. So obviously I want section 23. So then I'm gonna come over here and click where it says the city is St. Louis, Missouri, 1883. And I'm gonna get this overall index map, which is basically what I looked at. Um, and I know I need to find map 23. Those are gonna be in the left-hand column and I just need to scroll down. But before I do that, let's point out the direction of north on this map because that can be confusing to people. You have to figure out, you have to orient it. Just because it's the top doesn't mean it's north. And we know we want this South City area because we know we want section 23. It's down at the far end of Carondelet, sometimes called the patch. So I'm gonna scroll down to find 23. And there it is. So I'm gonna click on that and I'm gonna get just the map for the area 23. Now again, north is to the right in this case. Now it's got this key so I can look at this and understand what it's telling me. And if I zoom in on the map, I can find this area on Ivory Street. Well, there's 77, 19, 21, 23, and 25. Those are the ones we've already seen. And if we look at the key, it says they were brick buildings. And guess what? They were brick buildings back then. 1883, they were already standing brick buildings. 7731 and 33 were also standing. They were, they were brick, or they could have been stone. It says brick or stone. So it could be either one. However, 7729 was a vacant lot. Nobody had built anything there yet. And again, all the ones that are there are either brick or stone. Well, let's look at 1895, because we might get a different perspective on this. And again, 
we use the Google, we figure out where it is, and we know we need map number 40. And again, north is kind of diagonally to the upper right. So when I look on this actual map, in this case, north is at the top, and I'm looking at this area on ivory. Again, I've got a much bigger key for these. The difference of a few years in terms of the map, you get a lot more information. So 7729 Ivory was a frame building. That's what the yellow means. We know it didn't exist in 1883. We know it exists in 1895. So we can reasonably surmise that it was built sometime between those years. When, I don't know. If I wanted to know, I could probably do a deep search on it if I really desperately needed to know when it was built. But probably for a lot of purposes, knowing an eight-year window is probably good enough. Now, you notice on this one and the other one, it was just marked red. But here, 7734 is shown as, as blue, which means it's a stone building. It was built with stone. And it's got a frame porch in the back. That's the yellow part. But I want to draw particular attention to this one because it's a little bit more complex. So it's got a stone first floor, a brick second floor. There's some frame portions in the rear and then a one story brick addition in the back. So this was a fairly elaborate house, two and a half stories tall. So I've looked at those two. In fact, if I look at all of these, they pretty much look the same, all the way up to 1938. But when I look at the 1951, things get a little different. Because by 1950, those three houses had been torn down and replaced by a filling station, a concrete floor, with a cinder block and brick facade. So sometime between 1938 and 1950, the three houses were torn down. Again, I don't exactly know when, but somewhere in there and the gas station was built. Now I would guess that it was probably in the early part of that period or towards the end of the period. Why? Because World War II was in between and they probably wouldn't have done much construction because they couldn't have gotten any building materials. Now, another thing these can be quite useful for is if you wanna do a house history. So a long time ago, I used to live in this house and before you make fun of me, it looked better when I lived there. I made sure the grass was cut and the weeds were out from between the sidewalk and I didn't have the ugly uh, bars on the front door or the weird windows, panes. And I didn't have the chain link fence. So it looked a lot better when I lived there, but this is the way it looks now and I got this off Google. Well, an interesting thing about this house uh, if you're not familiar with this, the pictorial St. Louis uh, book from 1875 is pretty fascinating. Uh, they drew these wonderful architectural renderings of the entire city. And uh, it's pretty amazing, the stuff you can find on it. And if you look in this area here, which I'll blow up, uh, this is Frieden's Evangelical Church, which was across the street from that house. So this is New House Avenue, and where the blue arrow is, that's the roof of the house. Now you can't see much of that house, but you can tell that it existed because you know they don't generally just build roofs out over nothing. So let's see how that property evolved over time. Again, we go in through the search. This is the Google map to show where it is. And if I go in, on the fire insurance index. This is the 1883 overlay. And I can see it's in block 32. So this is the atlas from that, from plate 32. 
It's way over to the left side. And that one's 1915 New Hat. Again, it shows it being a brick building. Doesn't show much else. If I go forward in time, this is the 1889 Whipple. I can see I'm in 149. And it's down here. So this is what it looked like then. So this is 1915. Now, you can see that it's, uh, the front part is brick. But there's a wooden stable behind it. It's 1889, people, if they want to get around, they had to have a horse and maybe a buggy. And there was this frame structure off the back that included a water closet. Now, you, I mean, it's interesting to me, they didn't have a bathroom literally inside the house. It might have been an enclosure. It probably wasn't heated. And it's entirely possible uh, that it wasn't fully plumbed in a lot of parts of the city. Uh, it was basically an outhouse sitting over a sewer pipe and they'd flush the water through the pipe multiple times during the day to clean out anything that needed to be cleaned out. So was that what it is? I don't know, but that would be my guess. If we look at the next year, the 1904 Whipple, it's again 149, again down at the bottom, 1915, again had the stable and this frame structure. And if I do 1904 on Sanborn, it's in 100. So I can see things had changed quite a bit. That wooden structure was gone. Uh, they still had a stable back there. By 1950, it pretty much looked like it did when I lived there, a brick house, no wooden part on the back of it. Uh, it did have a garage. Now, I suspect the garage was probably really the old stable. They just started calling it a garage because by 1950, people put a car in there instead of a horse. Um, when I lived there, the garage wasn't there anymore. But my next door neighbor had a garage and uh, it had the, it had the uh, type of windows that they'd have in a horse stable where the horse could stick its head out. So I suspect that's what that garage looked like too. Now I want to look at this old stone hot house. And this is an interesting problem. So I thought, well, another interesting thing to look at would be this South Public Market in St. in, in Carondelet. Um, my grandfather ran the grocery store there, great grandfather ran the grocery store there. And as you can see from the architecture, the original public market part is still standing there. It's just surrounded by these brick additions in the front. I thought that might be interesting to look at over time. But as I was looking on Google, I came up with this, this old stone house in Carondelet. And I thought, this is even better. This is a, I'll be a story about a historic structure that's been there, it was probably built in the 1840s. And it looks old, and there it is. And so this is what it looks like on Google Maps, the South Public Market, and then just right down Broadway is this old stone house. So again, if I look, it's gonna be area 23. Well, there's the South Public Market, but the old stone house is not there. That seems pretty curious to me because I know that thing was probably built in the 1840s. So what's going on? Well, I look again, maybe it's just a mistake on the map. Not there. Got the public market, but no stone house. How can that be? In fact, I look through all of those. And I finally, even when I get down to 1950, uh, surely the house would be there by then. But no, got the market. But the place where the stone house is, there's nothing. 
So I found that rather curious and perplexing. How can that be? How can a building that's clearly that old not show up on this fire insurance map? That makes absolutely no sense. So I called my friends at the Carondelet Historical Society and said, so there's this building. It's in the South City Park, down there next to the South, uh, South, South Market. It's an old stone house. I know it's got to be old, but it's not showing up on any maps. What's the deal? Well, they told me it was the Anton Schmidt or Monsanto house. And it was built in 1859, but it was built at 8,000 8, and 8,004 Alaska. So what happened is there's a chemical plant over there, it was owned by Monsanto, and they were gonna expand. And to expand, they were gonna need to tear down this house. And so rather than lose the history of the house, they moved it to the park. So it was never originally here, it was originally somewhere else. So now I've got a whole nother area to look for this house and see what it looked like. So that's 8,000 Alaska. And it got moved over to Broadway. Well, if I look in 1883, it's just gonna be over here in this little part. Well, it's Tesson Street and 9th Street. 9th Street became Alaska Avenue. And it does look like maybe there's a house there. But again, this is the one that just shows stone and brick both is red. So that's probably it. But if I look at the next one, 1895, uh, yes, it's obviously that stone house. It's two, two properties connected, two houses connected, a row house. And it's clearly made out of stone because it's blue. And you notice already there's a chemical plant in the area. And again, as I keep looking, through all of these. Uh, there's two of them it didn't work for because although this fire insurance maps exist for St. Louis, they don't exist for this part of St. Louis for that time. But I can look at one more. And again, I can clearly see that it's a two part house. It's got a wooden back porch. And the chemical plant, well, that became Monsanto. That's why it's the Monsanto Schmidt house. Monsanto bought it and they didn't want to tear it down because they knew its historic significance, but they needed the land to expand their factory. Now to go a little bit further afield, um, if you live in St. Louis, there's a good chance at some point in your life, if you're an adult, that you went out to Herman, Missouri and sampled some of the wine that they make out there. And one of the wineries out there is this Hermanhof. Um, and they offer tours and wine tasting and, you know, someday they'll probably do that again. Um, and it's again out in Herman, about a hundred miles west of St. Louis. So what can we learn about that building? That looks like it was an old building. And we have fire insurance maps for Herman. And sure enough, I can look at this. This is the most recent one. And it's showing, there's the building uh, like that. Looks like it, brick building. And excuse me. And then on the side of it is an attached uh, frame structure that looks like that little white part of the building there. So it looks like it's pretty much the same in 19, uh, 1904, excuse me, 1932 as it is now. But if we go back to 1917, again, it looks pretty much the same still in 1917. 
very little change. But if we go back to 1908, it was part of a much larger complex. All those buildings were all connected. Most of that is gone. And it was the Herman Brewing Company. And this is the information it provided. It says there's no watchman. Why would they care if they had a watchman or not? They're offering fire insurance, not burglary insurance. Well, the fact is, if you had a watchman there all night and something caught on fire, there'd somebody, it would probably get reported pretty fast, whereas if there was no one and it caught on fire in the middle of the night. So that might affect your premiums. The lights are electric. The heat was steam in the brewery. Uh, there was water from good wells. Why would you care about that? Because if the water, if you had good water and the fire started out, up, you could put it out pretty easily. So that would probably make your premium go down. Uh, they had a uh, PP and Knowles steam fire pump and a large amount of one and a half inch hose. Uh, they used coal fuel for the beer kettle with steam heat. So that tells us a lot about that building and whether or not uh, you'd want to issue a fire insurance policy. Well, let me take it back. You can also see the buildings around it. What was going on in the neighborhood? That's one thing I really haven't talked about in this so far. So what's around it? Well, looks like a bottling plant, uh, more brewery across the street. Again, if we go back to 1898, this time it's the H. Crops Brewery in Malthouse. And they did have a watchman. They had electric light, steam heat in the brewery. So much of it was still the same. Now this one's a little different because it's an earliest one. Um, again, it's the H. Crop Brewery. No watchman lights or coal oil, no heat in the brewery, water from good wells, and fire pump. So pluses and minuses, you can see the progress of this. Also, you can look at the footprint of the building. It doesn't look as large here. Obviously, if it's a building, it's expanding. What happened in the meantime? Prohibition probably caused it to fall into disrepair because you would keep up a big building if you couldn't make beer in it. Um, what else would you do with it? Finally, let's look at the World's Fair. For those of us, particularly uh, white people uh, from St. Louis, we have kind of a exaggerated uh, beliefs about how awesome the World's Fair was. Um, and certainly it was beautiful. It was a one of a kind event. They had these elaborate, incredible buildings. Um, they did things that by our standards would certainly be racist. Um, they wouldn't let African-Americans, for example, buy food um, at the fair. Um, and they put uh, human beings from Africa and Asia on display as part of the exhibit. Well, if you look at the fairgrounds, this is pretty much that same picture, but it's oriented the other way. And so I wanna look at this central part right here. And we'll start with the festival hall. This is one of the big buildings. They had concerts and all kinds of things in it. It was this incredibly elaborately beautiful building. And yes, they needed to insure it for fire. Has a dome that was 200 foot. And the whole building was made out of frame, but it was covered with staff. Now, what on earth is staff? Well, staff is powdered gypsum or plaster of Paris. And they mix some cement and some glycerin and other stuff together. And then they put some rags in it when it was thick. 
uh, they cast it. And that's why they could get all these elaborate shapes. But it was basically glorified uh, paper mache. And it was designed to last for the year that the fair was open. And then they were going to tear it down anyway because they had to restore Forest Park back to what it used to be. So we can see that the fire insurance map does in fact reflect this. And we can look, we can get a pretty good idea of what this building looked like just based on the shape of the map, that it was framed, that it was staff. There was a space for the organ, there was a concert hall, there was offices. Um, just a lot about this building. Now immediately behind that building was something we are familiar with. That's the Fine Arts Palace. Um, we call it the St. Louis Art Museum now. And if you look on this, it was fireproof construction. It was one of the few intended to be permanent buildings. Uh, the reason was a lot of foreign governments were sending valuable art to be displayed at the fair and they didn't want it to be displayed in a paper mache building. They wanted it in a solid, real building that was as fireproof as it could be made at the time. Now, that's all good and well. And if you live here, you've got this great tool to get into it. But what if you don't live here? What if uh, you live in a different part of the country? Or what if you want to look at some part of the country that doesn't include uh, Missouri and Illinois. Well, you can find these elsewhere. One possibility, if you're looking for St. Louis and you don't live within the area that you can access this database, is you can go to Unreal City. And let's look at an example of that. Now, this is a fairly new statue that's been added in front of the old courthouse. It's Harriet and Dred Scott. Uh, two very famous St. Louisans. Um, and let's see what we can find out. So, Eliza and Wilson Madison, that's Harriet's daughter and son-in-law, were living at 6 Haight Hicks Alley in 1876 in City Block 181 per the Ghouls Directory. There was a Harriet Scott 61-year-old black woman who died on the 17th of June, 1876, in St. Louis at an alley between number six, at alley number six between 7th and 8th Street, and Locus and Olive, per the, per the St. Louis death register. And finally, the city directory uh, section for the 1876 St. Louis, describes Hicks Alley as north to south between 752 Locust and 751 Olive in block 181. Now all this information came from Ruth Ann Hager's book, uh, Dread and Harriet Scott, Their Family Story, uh, published in uh, 2010. So if we go to that area of the city right now, this is it. That looks nothing like a place that there might even be houses in the alley. But the alley still exists. And if you look south from Locust Street, this is what you see. You can tell that there's an alley that goes through there barely. And if you look north from Olive Street, again, you can see that there's this gap where the alley ran. But that's pretty much it. Well, we can go to Unreal City. We've got the option to browse and search. We can look at the interactive map. Some of this doesn't work yet. Uh, I don't know why it doesn't. We're just gonna go to browse. And we're gonna look at the Whipple map from 1870. So we've got to look in the index and figure out where this block is. Unfortunately, we know the block number, so we can find it. And then we can navigate through and find that block on the map. 
and I can see these row of houses, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Well, number six is that one. How do I know that? Because in St. Louis, buildings are, are north of market are numbered south to north. In south of market, they're numbered north to south. This is north of market. That's number six. That's where the family lived. That's where uh, Harriet Scott died. And if we zoom in on it and we look at the explanation, we can see that as a single story frame construction, uh, it's not a very big house, but it's a house off the alley. Well, what if we look? in the 1874 one. And we look at the index and find it. And then we go, click on that and it'll take us into the, the actual map. And that's this over here. And we can see that same row of houses is still there. And we can go to the pictorial atlas. And by the way, this is available at the Library of Congress. You don't have to look at ours. You can look at the individual plates. We find the plate for that area. And we can see those houses show up there too. Not a very good picture because I pulled it off the web, but it's there. So if we go to Whipple's 1876, we can see that it's 66. And about half of those houses are gone. Do the same thing here. And that whole block of houses is completely obliterated. It's lost to history. We'll never know exactly what those look like, but we know they're little frame houses facing the alley. Um, they're probably adequate shelter and not much more. That's where they would have been. If you're looking for maps from much of the rest of Missouri, the Ellis Library at the University of Missouri has these online. And there's a list of cities that you can get. And one of two things is gonna happen when you click on it. So we'll look at Blackwater. And you can see there's exactly one map. We click on it we can see that Blackwater was built along the railroad tracks and had basically a row of Main Street stores and the rest of it was residences in frame. And it's between Colum Columbia and Kansas City. If you're in that part of the state, stop. It's mostly antique stores and there's a restaurant. There's, it, it's kind of a cute little town. Uh, that's what it looks like today. And that's what it looked like I don't remember, I can't read the date on that, but early 1900s, I think. Pretty much the same. But if you keep scrolling down, if you come to Cape Girardeau, it's a bigger city. And you notice that the individual years that they have the fire insurance maps for are in individual folders. So you kind of have to click on that and then pick which part of the city you want to look at. If you're looking for Kansas City, the Kansas City Public Library has them. Um, I've not figured out a convenient way to look to uh, search through these. Uh, I would contact that library if, if you're interested in Kansas City. Um, they do have a number of years available. If you're looking for Illinois, they're at the University of Illinois. They've got 1,746. You can filter by place. We'll look at Belleville. This is Belleville 1884, the index. You can pick the individual page and then look at it.
Now, what about if you're looking somewhere else? Well, I didn't Google fire insurance maps for every state and every city in the country. But if you're looking for a state that we haven't covered, I would for sure try that. You want to know uh, fire insurance maps for Ohio? Google it. They probably have them at some repository. Maybe they've digitized them. The other option you've got is to go to the Library of Congress. So this is the Library of Congress's page for Sanborn maps. And if you scroll down, you have this option to pick a state and you can do more. And so I'm gonna pick Louisiana. And then if I get to the Louisiana page and scroll down, there's a list of cities and again, more locations. So you can find large and small cities in Louisiana. We're gonna go with New Orleans. And there's a lot of them here, but what are we gonna do with this? Well, let's find one. I had friends that used to live here at 1123 Column CM Avenue. This is in the Lower Garden District, if you're familiar at all with the city. They lived in an apartment that was up in the upper right side as you're facing the building. Um, the left side was all one house and there were two apartments on the right side. Uh, the owner's eventual plan was to convert it all into one big house but uh, he needed money to do that and was still working on his side. So he was renting out these other two apartments. And next door to it is this rather interesting looking building and I'm just gonna show it to you and we're gonna move on, but I will point out stuff about it as we get into these maps as well. So if you're familiar with New Orleans, the area that we're talking about for the Lower Garden District, this is Canal Street, the major street that runs between the river and the lake, um, separating the American side upriver and the French side downriver. Uh, St. Charles is there, it's on the American side. It runs parallel to the, to the river. It's where the famous streetcars are. Magazine Street is to the south or to the riverside. It, uh, people are maybe familiar with that because that's become a big antique area. And finally, Jackson Avenue is there. Uh, it's again, it's a major street. If you're riding a streetcar, you may be familiar with it. So as I zoom into this area where this property actually is, I want to clarify one thing, all right? In New Orleans, there are four directions and they are not, not north, south, east, and west. They are downriver, lake, river, and up. So downtown is downriver, uptown is upriver, the lake is up to Lake Pontchartrain, and the river is to the Mississippi River. Why do they do that? Because the streets all follow the river. So if you try to use north and south, it wouldn't make any sense because the streets curve around too much. There's also intersections of streets that would you would think would be perpendicular to each other and you can't figure out how that would be possible, but yet it is. And it's because of the curve of the river. So we just, people who live in New Orleans just talk about the river side, the lake side, the, the downstream side or the up, up, upstream side. So this is the area that we're looking at. Uh, it's uh, Thalia Street, Britannia Street, Coliseum Street, and Malpamine Street. And curiously, what I would consider to be the same street, um, if you're going uptown, it's Coliseum Street, but if you're going downtown, it's Camp Street on the other side of the of the the median or the neutral ground as they would call it. Um, again, that's, that, that's a quirk of New Orleans that they sometimes do things like that. Um, so that's the area that we're gonna look at for this house. Why am I doing this? Because this is an area of, I'm not as familiar with as the parts of St. Louis that I've done up to this point. 
I need to dig around a little bit and understand where the streets are and what's going on and how I can find these places because otherwise it's going to be hard to look at this map. So this is the 1937 and 1950 fire insurance map and it's got this nice key and I can look on this and try to figure out what part of the city it is. And I'm pretty sure that it's going to be in number four based on my looking at these maps pretty thoroughly. And sure enough, this is section four. And if I zoom into this particular area, there's Thalia and Britannia and Coliseum, except it's labeled as just camp there then, and Melpomene. So we're looking at this little area, uh, a map three, 380. So I've got to go through all these and find 380. And in this case, it was three pages worth of maps. I just had to scroll around till I found it. And it's here. So 1321 is right there. I can see that it's a frame building uh, sitting next to 23 and 25, also frame. It's two story, it's a front porch. And this property next to it says it's apartments. Okay, that looked like it could have been an apartment building. If I go further back, 1808 to 1909, 1908 to 1909 map, it's the same. But that building next door at that point was the first Church of Christ Scientist. And it was also a heat a stove and light and electric store. And I don't really know how they manage those two things. If I go back to 1896, there's a house. It was already standing then, frame, construction. But next door to that house was a wood yard. So they were selling lumber there. Go back to 1885. Again, the house I'm looking at is already standing. But the next door neighbor was the Camp Street Christian Church. And it was a brick building. Something happened to that building. Did it catch on fire and collapse? I don't know. But it was a different building than the one we're looking at now. Because it was, for whatever reason, it was gone. And they were using the space as a lumber yard until they built that other building that eventually became the apartment building. So we learned a little bit more about the neighborhood. What was it like? Well, turns out they lived next to the Camp Street Christian Church. Did the people that live there go there? Maybe. It's right next door. It's the other thing, look around these maps, see where the churches are, see where they might've gone. They're all gonna be on there. So what can we figure out from this? Um, there's a number of conclusions. The fire insurance maps give us a glimpse into the world of our ancestors' built environment. It's not a perfect picture, but we can see what their structures, what the footprint was, what they were built out of. We can kind of envision what they might have looked like. They can help us understand both residential and business areas of a city. Most of our ancestors probably had to go somewhere to go to work. What did that look like versus where they lived? Was it far away? Probably not. Um, what were the conditions like? We can look and see. And finally, they can be used for house history and other research purposes. And Personally, I think they're a lot of fun to look at and try to figure out. And they're fun to use, and they often contain surprises. And it was a big surprise to me that that stone house in Carondelet didn't show up on any of them. It was a big surprise to me to see that building, that elaborate building next to my friend's apartment uh, 
was a church and that it was a lumber yard and there was a church there before then. Um, we often don't know what was next to us or next to the property that we're looking at or next to our ancestors. And this gives us a good way to envision that. So if you've got any questions, um, we can cert we'll take them in the Q&A right now. Um, you can also uh, email us at genealogy at slcl.org or call us on the telephone 314-994-3300 and you're going to have to work your way through some complicated uh, phone prompts to get to us um, or you can contact us by mail or you can find us on our webpage. Okay, I'm going to jump in, Dan, if you don't mind. Uh, we had a couple of questions as you were speaking. And like Dan said, if you have any more questions, go ahead and type those in there now. Um, very early on in your presentation, you mentioned the old rock house. Um, is that still there or do you have any more inter interesting tidbits on that house? Uh, unfortunately, the old rock house no longer exists. It was, uh, it was originally built as uh, the fur trader Manuel Lisa's uh, trading post. And uh, the intention was when they cleared the arch grounds that they were going to leave it. Um, but because of the railroad tracks running right through the area, they didn't want the railroad tracks to run right in front of the arch and kind of spoil the view. Uh, they worked out a deal where they would enclose them in a tunnel. And in order to do that, they had to take down the old rock house. And uh, because, you know, they took it down and they had all the, all the stones there uh, to, with the plan to reassemble it. And uh, over time, the stones disappeared. Well, I'm not exactly sure what people thought they were going to do with them by taking them home, but, you know, people steal things if you leave them out unguarded. And so significant portions of them are gone. Uh, so they couldn't reconstruct it. Uh, there was also a problem with reconstructing it because uh, there was no back wall to it. It literally, the back wall was literally the bluff of the river, uh, was the limestone bluff. So they had to do something about that too if they moved it somewhere else. And I'm sure they could have worked, worked that all out, but they didn't have the stones to rebuild it with. So they rebuilt the facade of it um, it's inside the old courthouse, um, but the building itself is unfortunately lost. Okay, um, I think you've pretty much addressed this, but just to reiterate, because we have a question um, that that is uh, um, regarding this. Basically, if you're looking for fire insurance maps that are outside of the St. Louis area, your best bet, if I could reiterate what you said, is probably going to be contacting those local libraries and then the Library of Congress, correct? Yeah, the Library of Congress will probably have them. They've got them from most places in the country. Um, but if there may be a local library you know, uh, if it's a real small town, they may not have it at that library, but like at a state library or state archive or state historical society or university library, I would, uh, you know, I would Google something. I would do a Google, like say, uh, fire insurance maps, Cincinnati, Ohio, or fire insurance maps, Albuquerque, New Mexico, something like that, and just see what comes up because you might find them uh, digitized at a big library. If that doesn't work, go to the Library of Congress. Um, the hardest part for me in doing in looking at at those is the degree to which I'm familiar with the city. So if I was trying to look up where my ancestors lived in Cincinnati, if they had lived there, um, it'd be a challenge for me because I don't know enough about how the city's laid out. And so I'd have to spend a long time on Google Maps, just kind of getting the lay of the land so I could figure out which of the individual uh, fire insurance maps to get. But Library of Congress is a good option. Um, and again, try a local place because they may have digitized them, they may have indexes to them, you know, there's really no telling. 
Okay. All right. How about this one? Um, were there fire maps in Prussia as well in the 1870s? So were there fire maps in other countries? Most likely. Um, I've never done any research on that question, but I would be surprised if there weren't, uh, at least for the major cities. Uh, you know, they're going to want to insure their buildings too. Yeah. Yeah, because you talked about England, I guess, is where they where they started, but yeah. Yeah, well, the English kind of invented insurance. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, and then we had uh, several comments. Um, thank you for your presentation. Well done. Um, some of our attendees are excited to use these insurance maps for the first time. Um, but I think that's it for the question. So if anybody has one, if you want to get it in there, oh, it looks like we've got another one um, here. Oh, and great lecture. So... Hopefully you, you helped some people um, learn something new tonight. Well, I hope so. <laughs> it's always fun. Yeah. And okay. I think it uh, looks like we are stopping here. Don't see any new ones coming in. Um, all right. So thank you for joining us today. We hope you enjoyed the class and found the information to be useful. If you have any further questions or comments, please feel free to contact History and Genealogy. The phone number is up on your screen. The email is on, up on your screen as well. If you are watching this live, I remind you that this class has been recorded and will be made available on the library's website and the library's YouTube channel. If you are watching this on YouTube, we invite you to like this video and post a comment. This ends the webinar. Have a great evening.